So what is the ethics advisor? What, what was it that I was doing? I should probably say that, so right now I'm assistant professor in ethics of technology at the University of Trenta, but for the last two years I was working as an ethics advisor for one of the technical institutes at this university, the Center for Telematics and Information Technology. And so my role was different from the ethics committee, I was on the ethics committee, but my role as ethics advisor was, was different. I was wearing a different hat, if you will. So I would go meet with individuals one-on-one -on -one and talk to them about their research and problems that they might have. I would go to a research group and give a colloquium. So in the same way that, that we're sort of doing this now, talk. but of course I would talk about what is ethics? Ethics is about the good life and what are the three normative theories? So that they had an understanding of what we were talking about in the ethics domain. Yeah. yeah. So there's this you know, education for groups, there's an education sort of one-on-one, -on -one. but really the idea was that I was working alongside these individuals. So I wasn't something that was separate like the ethics committee. I came and visited them you know, once a week and we talked about things. I gave them reading material, they gave me reading material. We were working in conjunction with each other. Um, it was a very pragmatic ethics. So I'm not sure if you've done pragmatism. Um, but this idea of you know, learning by doing, of the method of inquiry, so understanding the situation before you can even reveal whether or not there is an ethical problem. That was the sort of method that I was engaged in. Um, the type of ethics that I dealt with then, I didn't commit myself to a deontological approach. You know, I didn't go in and say, what is your duty as a computer scientist or a computer engineer? Because of course they would come back with the Data Protection Act, but then how do you translate that into design requirements? Sometimes that, well, most of the time that isn't very clear. I also wasn't committed to a consequentialist approach. What are the consequences of using this product out in the real world? Sometimes that didn't really get us far because individuals individuals would say, I'm not responsible for what happens when it goes out into the real world. I'm just doing the fundamental research right now to help whatever company wants to buy it. So then the communication breaks down when they don't see any link with responsibility. I wasn't committed to virtue ethics, but I was consistently or constantly trying to um, get them to reflect on what their role as a computer scientist or a computer engineer was about. What did, what did this image of the good engineer look like? How did they act? How did they reflect on things? So uh, if I had to say that I was committed to one approach, I would say, Virtue ethics was always sort of in the background, but that wasn't how necessarily how I was evaluating any, anyone's decisions. What I was doing really was value analysis. So are you familiar with value sensitive design or the idea of the embedded values concept? No? Okay. So the embedded values concept is simply that there are technologies, no, <laughs> there are values embedded in a technology so that when you use the technology, the consequences of using it realize a value in the real world, yeah? So if we take it's something that you wouldn't even consider a technology, imagine you're in the hospital and you have the curtain, yeah, that goes around the patient's bed. The action of enclosing the curtain around the patient's bed brings privacy into reality, yeah? Using the curtain, the interaction between the human and the curtain realizes privacy. Now if we take this into a technical sphere, you can consider something like the company uh, Silent Circle, and they create the ability for individuals to have private phone calls. So using VoIP technology, you get a sort of a, a calling card, and you're able to have phone calls that are untraced and therefore cannot be tracked and are not stored in any sense of the word. So if you're in a country where you're a journalist and maybe you're worried about your safety there, this is an incredible technology so that when you use it, you are essentially having a private conversation. The consequences of using this technology are privacy. Or if you're in an abusive relationship and you don't want your spouse to be able to have any access to phone records, this technology then allows for your protection, your privacy. Yeah? So the idea there is that values and technology are very strongly linked. This is the embedded values concept. Now value sensitive design comes in and says, if we agree to that and we take that as our starting point, that this relationship exists, then why not intentionally design technologies in a way, a systematic way, that they always embed the values that we want them to.
and that we're very clear about um, understanding trade-offs and balances and we do this through the design process. So instead of at the end being, you know, oh, OMG, what have I done? I've created this technology that is, you know, terrible when it comes to maintaining privacy of individuals or now reflecting back on Facebook, right? What, what does privacy even mean here? So value-sensitive design scholars are saying, Let's try and leave that paradigm and now start at the beginning of the design process and create technologies in a way that encourages the promotion of values. So this is the approach that I was trying to do with these computer scientists and engineers, to get them to talk about what is, what is your intention here? And if I'm working in the internet security group, they're always saying, well, I'm protecting security. We are trying to blacklist anyone that's been caught delivering spam messages. And, and then they don't even think about the, the potential consequences or the other values that come into consideration. They wouldn't think that by blacklisting without having a just justification or a clarification on who that IP address was actually linked to, that they had the potential to mislabel malicious users in the way that they were actually doing this blacklisting. And so the idea of justice, right? Where does, where does justice or fairness come in? That these individuals that might have been taken over, so you can um, uh, hijack a system or an IP address, this happens many, many times. And if your computer is taken over, you could be blacklisted without having any idea of what's going on, that your computer is sending out a whole bunch of spam messages. Right? So even though you're promoting this ideal of internet security, what have you forgotten to look at? And, and is there any way that you can look at it and maybe change certain design requirements so that you can address justice or fairness throughout your research? So that's the kind of work that I was doing as ethics advisor. Um, I'll skip through this, but it's just sort of uh, in a paper I, I go into much more detail about this idea of the ethicist as designer and that there are very specific tasks that I was engaged in. But it's pretty much what I was pointing at right there. Now the scope of the work, so how in depth I can actually go, is dependent on a variety of things. The stage of the research, so if we're at the very beginning of the research project, you can have a lot more influence, if you will. You can help think along with the engineers, and then you have the potential to change some of their choices, or to help them change some of their choices. If they come to you after the data's been collected, after it's been shared, after all of these problems have happened, really your role is just to help reflect on what they did wrong, or what they should have taken into consideration. At that point, you can't really make any changes on their research. But that doesn't, I don't want to minimize uh, working with individuals that come to you at this later stage of development because these individuals will continue to do research and to collect data. So you still want to have an impact and to have them reflect on their decisions because then they will do that in their future professional roles. The context of the research. So the case studies that I'll be talking about are all in an academic setting. And uh, this is important because um, there's one value that doesn't get prioritized above all of the other values. That's the economic value, yeah? When you're in an, in an industrial setting, you might be trying to consider, OK, how do we protect people's privacy? How do we maintain security? And then you have you know, the corporate interest coming in and say, well, we're going to have to trade those off because you know, we have shareholders, we have stakeholders that want us to be making money. And so we're going to have to make money in whatever way we see fit. So I leave that. Um, discussion to the side, and right now we just talk about this academic setting so that we can really uh, have a different understanding of coming to terms with the values at stake. 